good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions. And as ever, I would be grateful for short and succinct questions and answers, please. Question number one, Alison Johnston. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the introduction of employment tribunal fees has had on youth and women's employment. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. The Scottish Government supports better regulation to assist sustainable economic growth, but we have consistently opposed policies which encroach on employees' existing rights. The Minister for Energy, Enterprise and Tourism wrote to Joe Swinson MP in June 2013 outlining this government's opposition to these fees, highlighting that for many people fees will represent an unaffordable risk eh, regardless of the strength of the case. And we believe that the introduction of such fees could lead to women and young people having an adverse experience in the workplace. Thank you. Alison Johnston. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. The, the TUC have said that women indeed have been amongst the biggest losers. A year down the line, now that we have the data, we see equal pay claims have dropped by 84% and sex discrimination cases are down 81%. Now that we're beginning to see the effect of these changes, will the Cabinet Secretary write to the UK Government again, supporting the Law Society for Scotland's call for a review of this patently unfair fee and remission regime? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, President Officer, I'll be happy to uh, uh, cede to uh, that request. Um, as a government, we've continually made clear uh, our opposition to fees. I'm very well aware um, of the position of the TUC and Unison, as well as the, the Law Society for Scotland, and some very important um, information published recently by the Citizens Advice Bureau, uh, showing that seven out of ten potentially successful cases uh, are not actually being pursued. Supplementary from Richard Simpson. So I wonder if the Minister would agree with me that since the unions are actually paying for those members, uh, the, these fees, which we all agree should not be being imposed anyway, but do, would, she, would she agree with me that, that there is a very strong need to encourage every worker in Scotland to join an appropriate trade union to have the defence that they deserve? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I uh, understand the point that Mr Simpson is making and uh, while of course it's up to individuals whether or not they join um, a union, um, I can certainly uh, advocate the merits uh, to any worker or any uh, employee the length and breadth of Scotland of actually joining a union um, and this is a, a prime example uh, of when you may well indeed uh, require a union to support you in your workplace. Thank you. Question number two, Jane Baxter. To ask the Scottish Government what involvement the Cabinet Secretary for Training, Youth and Women's Employment will have in the training programme for the recently announced additional 500 health visitors. Angela Constance. The Scottish Government is investing in additional refreshed training for health visitors as part of a wider package of investment in the health visiting workforce, which was announced on the 18th of June this year, which will ensure the delivery of 500 new health visitors post by 2017-18. Health visitors play a vital role in contributing to the health and well-being of children and families. The lead responsibility for this work falls within the portfolio of the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing and will be taken forward by him. Uh, this welcome investment has potential outcomes across all areas of government and I will ensure uh, that the areas under my remit uh, fully support it uh, as they already support a wide range of activity in developing the NHS workforce. Jane Baxter. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. It is vital that all young people, regardless of background, have an opportunity to develop their skills and find employment which suits them. As the position of health visitor is rightly a highly skilled role, what steps has the Cabinet Secretary taken to ensure that there are appropriate pathways of progression for young people into the profession, especially for those from diverse backgrounds? Cabinet Secretary. I think uh, Ms Baxter makes a very uh, important and uh, valid point and uh, certainly over the past few years uh, we have uh, developed um, an increasing range of modern apprenticeship frameworks in both health and social care uh, and the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing has been a great advocate for the use uh, of those uh, apprenticeships uh, within uh, the health service and his plans uh, for expansion. But if Ms Baxter has any specific ideas, I'd be more than happy to discuss those with her. Thank you. Supplementary from Liz Smith. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, could I ask you at what stage the Scottish Government will be able to tell us what the local authority breakdown is of the 500 additional uh, health workers? 
Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I will ask uh, Alec Neely, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing, to provide that information directly to Ms Smith. Thank you very much. Question number three, Malcolm Chisholm. To ask the Scottish Government what support skills development Scotland provides to the training of women over 25. Angela Constance. Skills Development Scotland provides a range of training options to individuals, including women aged over 25. In each year of the current Parliament, I have asked Skills Development Scotland to deliver uh, 25,000 modern apprenticeships uh, open to those aged 25 uh, and over in key and enabling sectors, uh, over 17,000 pre-employment training places through the Employability Fund, 7,000 flexible training opportunities to support upskilling in the workplace and targeted support for low-paid, low-skilled and unemployed individuals uh, through Individual uh, Learning Account Programme. And in addition to this, uh, through its All Age Career services, uh, SDS provides professional advice uh, to individuals, including women over uh, 25, not only on the training options it manages, but on the wider education and skills offer uh, available through our further and higher education institutions. Uh, I thank the Minister for that, it's Cabinet Secretary, sorry, for that answer, but will she look at the reduction in skills development Scotland training support for women over 25, many of whom are forced to seek work once their child becomes five? Does she realise that this has had very negative consequences for the Child Care Academy at North Edinburgh Child Care, which I know she uh, is uh, as well. Uh, this uh, used to provide training for many women over 25, but now has to concentrate on those under 25. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm more than happy to uh, meet with Mr Chisholm to discuss uh, the specifics of that, um, because it would be good to understand the uh, specifics regarding uh, that childcare centre and what's happening uh, locally. Um, but as I say, we have a range of provision provided by Skills Development Scotland that is indeed um, available to those over 25 years of age and it should be available to people uh, over 25 years of age. Obviously, uh, provisions such as apprenticeships um, are, uh, you know, the demand is led by um, employers, so there are issues about the wider uh, labour market, but I'm happy to pick that issue up with Mr Chisholm directly. Many thanks. Question number four, John Pentland. To ask the Scottish Government what percentage of the quarterly increase in employment between March and May 2014 was represented by women? Angela Constance. Represented 88%, that's 11,000 of the overall 13,000 increase in unemployment over the quarter. It's important to note, however, that female unemployment is down 2,000 over the year. Uh, women's employment is at a record high, and there are now more women employed in Scotland than, than at any point since records began in 1992. With Scotland's economy now back above pre-recession levels and more women are choosing to enter the workforce and beginning to look for employment, moving from economic inactivity and therefore appearing in the numbers. Thank you. John Pentland. I kind of thank the Minister for her answer, but I believe the importance of these figures is that women are far more vulnerable to job losses, in this case 88% of them. Is it not the case that the Scottish Government is failing to adequately address this issue? And with the UK figures for that period showing a 25,000 reduction in women's unemployment. Does this not suggest that the Scottish Government has got its priorities wrong? Cabinet Secretary. Um, with respect, if I could say to uh, Mr Pentland, it is always um, interesting when people in his party um, expect uh, the Scottish Government to have all of the responsibility but only ever have the, the limited powers. And I'm more than happy for the Scottish Government to uh, have all the responsibility for employment matters, but that does indeed uh, require a yes vote uh, on the 18th. I think it is very important to look at labour market statistics uh, in the round. There are indeed uh, quarterly uh, variations that aren't always uh, pleasing. Uh, there are particular issues that do make women more vulnerable uh, in the, the labour market. But if we are to really understand the experience of women in work, we have to look uh, at all the statistics available and it should be welcomed uh, that record levels uh, of employment and also that inactivity is consistently fallen in Scotland and since 1999 since the establishment uh, of this parliament, presiding officer, uh, economic inactivity uh, amongst women um, has fallen by uh, 7%, and that has to be welcomed. Uh, so I think that would indicate that we are making some progress. There is indeed uh, more to be done, because one unemployed Scot, whether a young person or a woman, is indeed one too many for me. And there's a stream of investment and a stream of work being led uh, by this government through the, through the strategic uh, uh, group on women and work 
work and investment uh, in skills uh, and training to do everything that we can within our current powers uh, to get women in this country uh, back to work. But I would indeed uh, like this parliament to have full economic powers and, of course, uh, control over uh, issues such as Job Centre Plus and uh, rectify uh, the failing work programme. Question number five, Richard Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support the 120 women who became unemployment each day back into employment. Cabinet Secretary. Female employment is now at uh, over one. 1.2 million. It's its highest level since comparable records began. And we are determined to support those who are moving into the labour market and seeking work as the economy continues to grow. Although employment remains as yet reserved to the UK Government, we know that the challenges women face are complex and we are taking a cross-government approach to supporting them. And this includes our investment of more than a quarter of a billion pounds to expand funded high-quality childcare from August. The implementation of the Framework for Women's Enterprise, which aims to help more women to start their own businesses, funding to encourage more employers to introduce more flexible working patterns, and funding to tackle occupational segregation, particularly in science, technology, engineering and maths-related careers. Richard Simpson. I thank the Minister for that, for that response, but uh, her response to the previous question of saying it would all come right with independence now looks a more distant prospect um, and I think that we need to prepare for the supposition that we will remain part of the United Kingdom. Uh, does the Minister share my concern that uh, of the 13,000 women who found themselves out of work between March and May, 88% of them were women? And can the Minister also advise me what steps the Scottish Government are taking to encourage Scottish businesses to work with the many women who want to have a career break? in making sure that the opportunity is there to allow them to return to work at the same professional level as when they first took that career break. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, of course, Mr Simpson, I'm more than entitled to my view and to be a campaigner uh, that advocates for independence. Uh, and I will stick to my very firm belief uh, that Westminster continues to fail women uh, in this country. And we only have to look at welfare reform as one example. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting, President Officer, the figures uh, that Mr Simpson quotes. He talks about 120 women, but the 120 women he talks about is the number, uh, is the increase in the number of women that become economically active um, and not just, you know, uh, the, the rise in uh, un unemployment. Um, and we have to recognise that more women um, are actively seeking uh, work uh, within the labour market and that we have uh, to grasp that. Um, on the side, um, I think the point where we perhaps could unite on is the issue about flexible working and the issues about uh, people, women who have high skills, high levels of qualification, having a career break to have their children and then uh, returning to work and having to um, accept work or can only find work uh, where they are effectively underemployed. And I can um, unite with Mr Simpson um, on that point. Uh, underemployment is a serious issue uh, for women and is, a, again, a stream of work that we're pursuing through the strategic group uh, on women and work and with our constant engagement with employers. Briefly, please, Jenny Manor. If the Cabinet Secretary is so keen on getting women in Scotland back into work, why has her government presided over 80,000 less women getting into college since her government took power in 2007? Well, I firmly believe that women in this country should have uh, choices and uh, opportunities about the education they pursue and indeed about the, the, the careers that they pursue. Order, and please. of course it's to Miss Mara's shame that she constantly blisters the information and the facts uh, about college uh, education because the reality is that women are not underrepresented uh, in college education. And while she may, while she may shout Order, from her Ms. sedentary Madden. position and, as usual, try and compare uh, apples with pears, but the harsh reality is the facts are that the only comparable measure is full-time equivalent. And this government, this government has met its commitments, has met its manifesto commitments to retain full-time equivalent. Order, please. We need to hear the answer. At uh, 116,000. Uh, uh, and college reform is indeed very important in terms of uh, upskilling and helping to respond to the needs of the local uh, labour market. But the reality is women are not underrepresented uh, in the college sector and our college sector is well up uh, for the challenge in preparing young people and women uh, towards their journey into work. Thank you. Question number six, Bill Kidd. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what employment opportunities <clears throat> have been created through the Youth Employment Scotland scheme. Cabinet Secretary. The Youth Employment Scotland Fund aims to help businesses with a threshold of 400 employees, social enterprises and third sector employers create 10,000 job opportunities for young people across Scotland. Bill Kidd. I thank the Minister for that reply. Can the Minister provide the Chamber with further information on how this success has benefited local, commun benefited local communities such as in my constituency of Glasgow Annie's Land? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Youth Employment Scotland Fund uh, has been uh, very successful and has funded uh, a wide range of sustainable employment uh, opportunities, jobs for young people uh, in a variety of sectors, whether it's retail, uh, agriculture, tourism, catering, uh, even in the equine industry, uh, events uh, coordinators, uh, trainee paralegals and solicitors' offices uh, right uh, across Scotland. And our uh, ambition um, and our uh, confident uh, in reaching our target of 10,000 uh, opportunities and this is a very uh, valuable scheme uh, that's part of a range of schemes that are having a positive impact on young people in this country. I have a brief supplementary. Tavi Scott, please. Uh, I broadly agree with the Cabinet Secretary's uh, uh, analysis of the scheme. Has she made any decision yet on continued funding for it, given that it's due to run out in December? And the organisers in Shetland tell me that it would help in their planning were the government able to make an announcement about, about the future. And would, you, would she also be able to clarify the position with regard to the SDS Certificate of Work Readiness, as that's seen as a very valuable uh, and tool for young people in, in furthering their passage into work? Is she able to clarify whether that might be included in an enhanced scheme for the future. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, just to clarify uh, to Mr Scott that the Youth Employment Scotland Fund doesn't end uh, in December. It is a scheme that uh, goes across two financial years and will continue until the end um, of this financial year. Uh, we are currently undertaking a review of the youth employment strategy and will be taking a very careful look, uh, particularly in light of the recommendations from the Young Workforce Commission about the future role of uh, wage subsidies. And indeed, certificate of work readiness uh, has been very successful and we will be continuing with that. Many thanks. Question number seven, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what representations it has made to the UK Government about equalising the minimum wage regardless of age given the impact on youth employment. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government believes that work should be fairly rewarded. Uh, with independence, we would ensure that the minimum wage rises by at least inflation and establish a Fair Work Commission, which, along with assessing the minimum wage, would also be asked to consider the appropriate minimum wage uh, for both young people and apprentices. The Low Pay Commission call for evidence for the 2015 minimum wage rate asked specifically for information on the minimum wage for young people and the Scottish Government welcomes views on that issue prior to submitting our response. Uh, in response to the call for evidence in 2014, uh, the Minister for Energy, Enterprise and Tourism raised the importance of the national minimum wage for apprentices and called for it to be continuously assessed to ensure it keeps pace with rising costs faced by our young workforce. Briefly, Neil Finlay, please. Um, Why doesn't the Minister support using the powers... Sorry. Oh, it's <laughs> Mr Finney. For... Sorry, John Finney. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. Uh, uh, I, I thank uh, the Minister for that response, which sounded like we've made no representations. Could I encourage you to make representations? Because in 1998, when the UK Government made the national minimum wage uh, law in order to make sure that employees in the UK are provided with, I quote, decent minimum standards and fairness in work, any discrimination, including age discrimination, is unwelcome. And I would encourage you to make these representations and I would encourage a commitment to eradicating them in an independent Scotland, please. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, would, uh, I will uh, encourage Mr Finney to uh, look back at the uh, official record uh, after uh, today's uh, session. But can I say to him uh, that, in principle, um, people should get the same rate of pay uh, if they're doing uh, the, the, the same job. And that's uh, an important uh, principle. I believe in an independent Scotland that Mr Finney and I will be on the same sign, side and the Fair Work Commission uh, will have a very uh, important role. Um, I'm on record as supporting the uh, Scottish Youth Parliament and their One Fair Wage uh, campaign. And while I recognise that employers um, you know, expect to pay uh, people in training a different rate to those um, employees who are time served or fully qualified, we've got a lot to learn 
from the European experience. In some European countries, those differentials um, are not too great. In other European countries, uh, those differentials um, are uh, quite, quite stark. Um, but I believe very firmly that um, people should get the same rate of pay uh, for uh, the, the, the same job. And now, briefly, Neil Finlay, please. Why doesn't the Minister uh, use the powers that she has at the moment and support, for example, the increase to the living wage, especially through the procurement process? You have the powers. Why are you not doing it? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, as Mr uh, Finlay well knows, this government, unlike the previous Labour Scottish Executive, has led by example on the living wage and has done everything, everything, please. everything within our everything within our Arte. powers uh, within current EU rules and I would have hoped that Mr Finlay would have had the grace to recognise that statutory guidance uh, addressing issues such as terms and conditions and pay is a very uh, important step forward. But I, of course, want to make a bigger step forward and have a Fair Work Commission because the big scandal is that since 2008, the national minimum wage has not kept a pace with the cost of living. And that happened under uh, Mr Finlay's uh, watch and not the watch uh, of this government. So I believe firmly that this Parliament uh, should have the, the economic powers to be addressing issues uh, such as low pay and, and work Secretary. poverty. Thank you very much. We are now moving on to questions on Commonwealth Games, sports equalities and pensioners' rights. Question number one, Stuart Maxwell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what legacy is anticipated from the Commonwealth Games? And Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson, please. Uh, can I first of all recognise Stuart Maxwell's role in uh, helping to secure the, the bid in 2007 and taking through the first uh, two years of, of planning uh, the Games? Uh, first, I'm sure everyone will agree that these Games were a, a spectacular sporting success and fantastic for both Glasgow and Scotland's international reputation. It's an endorsement to all partners that a legacy from these Games was in place before they even began. Planning started early. There are now over 50 national programmes and over 80 supporting projects in place, and people are benefiting now. Focusing on sport alone, there have been a massive investment in school sport and sport facilities across Scotland, which will leave a lasting legacy from the Games. Thank you, Stuart Maxwell. Yeah, can, I th can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, that answer, in particular, kind words about my own role uh, uh, during uh, surrounding the bidding process itself and, of course, the early years of planning. It was a pleasure and privilege to be involved at that stage. Uh, can I add my thanks and congratulations to all our athletes, officials and volunteers who were involved in the very successful Glasgow Commonwealth Games? And can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what steps the Scottish Government is taking to achieve a lasting health benefit for the people of Scotland and a concomitant saving in health spending by encouraging all Scots to take up some moderate physical activity as a lasting legacy from the highly successful Glasgow Commonwealth Games. Cabinet Secretary. Thank, can I thank Stuart Maxwell uh, for his remarks, uh, particularly how fantastic uh, our athletes and the, the rest of the team in delivering these games were. Um, in order to uh, help achieve a, a lasting health benefit, a, a 10-year physical activity implementation plan to tackle physical inactivity in Scotland was launched in February of this year. And this provides the framework for delivering the active legacy ambitions from the Commonwealth Games. In addition, you may be aware that the walking strategy um, was launched in June of this year, which encompasses a wide range of walking settings, including uh, recreational, uh, school-based. Um, in addition to that, the updated cycling action plan sets out our vision um, to improve an, um, the number of everyday journeys uh, taken in Scotland uh, by bike. And finally, uh, to support this work, we have invested almost £3 million in physical activity projects aimed at those groups who are uh, at the moment uh, not taking part in physical activity. And we hope to see the results of that um, over the, the course of, of time. Thank you. Question number two, Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to build on the success of the Commonwealth Games. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government remains committed to working together to secure a legacy fit for Scotland. With the excitement of these fantastic games still uh, reverberating throughout the nation, the focus now is to build on the legacy already achieved. 
People across Scotland are already benefiting. For example, Scottish-based businesses won 69% of contracts associated with the Games. Nine, 1,900 young people are already being trained under the £5 million Young Persons Fund. 133 community sports hubs are already operating across the country, complemented by 109 projects so far enjoying funding from the Active Places Fund. And over a quarter of a million school pupils are involved in Game on Scotland. Sandra White. Um, thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for the very comprehensive uh, reply. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, yesterday in your statement, you mentioned the fantastic work carried out by the many thousands of volunteers during the Commonwealth Games. Can I ask if the Scottish Government has any plans to harness this excellent initiative uh, for future volunteering events? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, we do. It's absolutely essential that we harness that the passion of the nearly 51,000 individuals who applied to become Clydesiders. Details of Clydesider applicants who gave their permission, successful and unsuccessful, are currently being transferred to the National Volunteer Scotland database, allowing them to stay informed about future volunteering opportunities. On the 5th of uh, December um, uh, last year, Volunteer Scotland unveiled its newly redesignated volunteer website, providing a, a user-friendly way of finding such opportunities. We'll con continue to work with Volunteer Scotland and other legacy partners to ensure these opportunities are varied and exciting. Many thanks. Um, I see Dave Thompson has now entered the chamber. So question number three, Dave Thompson. Uh, can I apologise, presiding officer, for being late into the chamber? I must admit uh, I got caught up in other things and uh, I forgot. And I, I, I sincerely apologise for that. Um, to ask the Scottish Government whether there will be a notable Commonwealth Games legacy to the more remote areas of the country. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, there will. The Scottish Government is committed to creating a, a lasting legacy and maximising the benefits for the whole of Scotland from hosting the 2014 Commonwealth Games. Local authorities have played an important role in spreading the legacy benefits the length and breadth of the country. The Solus Legacy Leads Network uh, from local authorities provides a platform for promoting opportunities, coordinating activity and working together to secure a legacy we can all be proud of. Dave Thompson. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Uh, she is aware, I know, of the Lochaber Sports Association plans to develop a training facility and the great work they've done in Lochaber uh, to get all of the sports clubs and others uh, on board in relation to this. And I just wonder um, if she has any further information for me in relation to the, the grants which might be available from Sports Scotland, etc., in relation to this. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, since we met to discuss uh, the Lochaber Sports Association's plans for an indoor training facility, officials from Sports Scotland have met with a, a number of key stakeholders to explore ways of ensuring that the association's plans can be realised. This includes the involvement of High Life Highland in operating the facility, which should remove a significant barrier to delivering the project. I understand that the association are in the process of raising funds for the planning application, which will be submitted by uh, Kilmali uh, Community Council on its behalf. As you're aware, this is a, a crucial step in the process and once approved, would then allow funding bodies to consider applications that are before them. I will take supplementaries on this question, but the questions and answers must be brief. Please, Jenny Mara. What will the Commonwealth Games legacy be for Dundee? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, I'm sure the, the, the member should be aware that there are already a number of legacy projects operating in Dundee, community sports hubs, for example, six uh, underway across the city, uh, successful active places funds, which have helped to supplement the, the local sporting offer. And of course, the uh, regional performance centre discussions are well underway. Uh, I'm sure Jenny Mara would be able to receive an update on uh, those discussions if she uh, chose to ask. Um, but they are well underway, very much supported by the local uh, sporting organisations, and that will be a great asset uh, to taking forward sport in the city. Thank you. I'm not convinced indeed the more remote area of the country, however. Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, <laughs> President. I think I qualify on that one. Uh, thank you, President. Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary accept the arguments about uh, transport costs being a very major part of the legacy for the Commonwealth Games? And would therefore she agree to meet a delegation of parents, coaches, and indeed uh, volunteers from Shetland uh, in the autumn? 
autumn, once Parliament returns, to discuss this vital aspect of making sure our athletes can compete with the best across Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I first of all just take the opportunity to once again congratulate Eddie Davies, who is uh, such a great ambassador for Shetland, and I'm um, sure uh, the whole of Shetland will turn out for her return uh, to the island. Uh, this issue is an issue that has been raised um, by uh, local authority colleagues. We are working with COSLA on the uh, working group on sport uh, to address a number of issues. This is one that was raised um, and we are looking at how uh, we can uh, better to, uh, uh, support um, people who are requiring to uh, uh, travel from more remote communities to compete. Uh, I'm happy to keep uh, Tavish got updated about that and of course I would be happy to meet any uh, local delegation that he wants to arrange to meet with me. Thank you. If I could urge brevity in questions and answers, we might make a bit more progress. Question number four, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the assertion of the International Business Times about an independent Scotland's participation in the 2018 Commonwealth Games. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Scotland is already a member of the Commonwealth through the UK and so already meets the essential requirements. Following a vote for independence, the Scottish Government will initiate steps to ensure Scotland's distinct mem membership as swiftly as possible. Scotland is, only, is one of only six countries to have competed in every Commonwealth Games and I look forward to seeing Scotland compete at the Gold Coast in 2018 and in every future Games. Thank you, Stuart Stevenson. Um, I hope to join the successful team uh, by competing in 2018, but uh, more realistically, does the Cabinet Secretary uh, think that we have laid the foundations for an even bigger success in 2018 using the powers of independence, of course? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we already have a, a fantastic uh, world-class sporting system through the Institute as part of Sports Scotland, which has seen the uh, £50 million pound uh, investment in uh, uh, th that performance over uh, the last funding period. That has led, of course, to the fantastic performance of uh, 53 uh, medals, 19 gold at these Commonwealth Games. That will be a, a tough target to exceed in the Gold Coast in 2018, but I'm sure through the continued support of our elite athletes, which of course will continue uh, post-independence, that our athletes will continue to excel on the world sporting stage. Thank you. Question number five. Gordon Macdonald. To ask the Scottish Government whether pensioners in an independent Scotland would be guaranteed their state pension and whether they would be paid at the same rate as in the rest of the UK. Cabinet Secretary. In the event of independence, Scottish pensioners will continue to receive their state pensions as now, on time and in full. This, Scottish, uh, this Government has committed to protecting the value of state pensions and will uprate state pensions by the triple lock for the first term of an independent Scottish Parliament. Scotland is in a strong position to afford a high quality pension system. Total expenditure on social protection, which covers pensions and broader welfare spending, has been lower in Scotland than in the UK over the last five years. God, MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The UK state pension is the lowest in the European Union at only 33% of the average wage, or £113 per week, compared to the average European state pension of 41% of average earnings. What steps would an independent Scotland take to tackle pensioner poverty? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Scotland's future set out that in an independent Scotland, savings credit would be a retained savings credit, which is being abolished for new pensioners in the UK from 2016 as an extra payment for those uh, who for those have set aside money for their retirement and particularly helps poorer pensioners. In addition, we have committed to uprating uh, guarantee credit each year by the triple lock. Guarantee credit ensures a minimum income guarantee in retirement and again supports poorer pensioners. Both these steps provide a level of security in relation to state pensions, which under current plans will not be available in the UK from 2016. This government has also committed to setting the, the single tier pension due to be introduced from 2016 for new pensioners at £160 per week. The UK government has yet to commit to such a level. Briefly, Jackie Bailey. If Alex Salmond has to resort to plan B, C, D or E, can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what currency pensions will be paid in? Uh, we'll we'll just stick to Plan A and we'll pay our pensioners in pounds as they do at the moment. Thank you. Question number six, Hugh Henry. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of recent comments by the Cabinet Secretary with responsibility for pensioners' rights, whether it will rule out an increase in state pension aged to 67 if Scotland decides to separate from the rest of the UK. Cabinet Secretary. 
Independence would give future Scottish governments the ability to develop a fairer pension system for Scottish citizens, one that is based firmly on our needs and circumstances. If we form the first government of an independent Scotland, we will establish an independent commission to consider a state pension age that is aligned to Scottish needs and circumstances, taking into account life expectancy, fairness and affordability. This will report within the first two years of an independent Scotland. As I indicated to the member in a similar question in May of this year, this government reserves judgment on the rapid increase in state pension age to 67, as planned by the UK government and supported by his party. Uh, President officer, of course, the Commission could make a recommendation for any one of a number of ages. So will the Cabinet Secretary take this opportunity to guarantee that if Scotland separates from the UK, that there will be no increase in the pension age to 67, and if not, why not? Cabinet Secretary. Well, because we would set up an independent commission to consider a state pension age that is aligned to Scottish needs and circumstances. Why would we do that if we had predetermined the outcome of that commission? So, as I repeated to him in my first answer, we will set up the commission to look at all these circumstances, particularly Scottish circumstances, and importantly, life expectancy, fairness and affordability. That will report within the first few years of an independent Scotland. This government will then take a judgment in terms of what that report tells us. Question number seven, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason it considers that an independent Scotland would continue to receive UK sport funding, given that UK sport does not fund sporting activity in other countries. Cabinet Secretary. UK Sport is funded by the UK Government through the Department for Culture, Media and Sport and currently Scottish athletes who are identified to compete for Team GB and Paralympics GB are supported through the UK Sport's World Class Performance Programme. Following a yes vote in the referendum, we will enter negotiations with the UK Government on many issues, including the transfer of resources. It is only appropriate that, as a function currently performed by UK Sport, we transfer to Scotland, that we seek an appropriate transfer of resource and assets of that organisation. It will then be for this Parliament of an independent Scotland to decide how best to generate and deploy this resource to the benefit of Scottish sport in future, but we will guarantee and ensure that our elite athletes continue to receive the support they require to perform well on the international sporting Jenny stage. Mara. Well, that's reassuring to know that the Cabinet Secretary feels that there will be enough money in Independent Scotland to maintain elite athletes' funding at the level that it currently is, because I don't think there's a lot of people... Order, please. I don't think Briefly, there's a lot of Ms. people Mara. or athletes in the country that would agree with that, because UK sport funding criteria is that athletes who are not British nationals are not eligible for that UK sport funding. And the National Lottery does not fund elite sport outside the UK. So how does she think she will have enough Cabinet money. Secretary. Well, because the bit Jenny Mara actually failed to mention was that Scottish taxpayers actually yeah. contribute to UK sport funding and to the lottery funding. So it is only right and proper that UK sport, which is currently funded partially by Scottish taxpayers, that that resource uh, remains in Scotland to fund uh, elite athletes and, of course, the lottery resource. Likewise, uh, we would uh, want to continue, given that Scottish taxpayers contribute to that lottery. Um, I should also say that the, the fantastic performance of our Commonwealth Games athletes was done entirely through the Institute of Sport and Sports Scotland uh, resource. What we would do with the uh, funding entitlement through UK Sport, which at the moment UK Sport has £350 million worth of resource, we would be entitled to our share of that because we pay into that. So therefore, we would use our share of UK sport funding to supplement the resource uh, to elite athletes. Elite athletes have nothing to fear. We would support them uh, in a way that will in, uh, enable them to perform on the world stage in the excellent way that they can currently do at the moment. I'm going to call question number eight, but I need brief questions and brief answers, please. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Can I ask the Scottish Government what legacy it expects to see from Pride House at the Commonwealth Games? Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government believes that Pride House, the first uh, at any Commonwealth Games, has increased the visibility, inclusion and participation of lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans transgender and intersex people, not only in sport, but in society more generally. 
Human rights campaigners have commented that one of the legacies of Glasgow 2014 will be focusing attention on the homophobic legislation of 80% of countries in the Commonwealth. On Friday, the 1st of August, the Ugandan Constitutional Court annulled the Anti-Homosexuality Act, which was strongly criticised by this government. We welcome this development. Patrick Harvey. I'm very grateful to the Scottish Government, Glasgow's City Council and uh, Glasgow 2014 for the support they've given to Pride House. One of the things that it's reminded the LGBTI community in Glasgow of is the importance of a non-commercial community space in the city. It's years since we've had one. Will the Minister, with her equalities remit, make contact again with the organisers to explore what support the Government and the City Council could do to realise the ambition of achieving a permanent community space, which will indeed help to foster the links with human rights activists around the world, as well as local uh, priorities too. Briefly, please, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm certainly uh, happy to look at that. Obviously, it would have to be something that was sustainable and uh, um, could, uh, could be taken forward uh, in that way. But I'm certainly happy to have further discussions with the organisations and uh, Glasgow City Council and, and looking whether that's feasible. Many thanks. That concludes question time. I may now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 10724 in the name of Keith Brown on Trident. We are tight for time this afternoon.